The next couple problems are going to be about the development process. Now, a lot of these questions seem pretty obvious to some people. They might come across as kind of the common sense part of the exam. However, there's a lot of little things that you might disregard as not being important that cause a lot of people to actually miss these questions and get these wrong. So here's a good starting example to prove that point. Now, this is actually a question that I have put in a quiz in the past, and a lot of people got this question wrong because they underestimate how important this factor is. The question is asking here is about having users participate in the development process of some kind of software. What are the benefits of having a user participate? Generally, the value of having a user participate in the development process is to get feedback or useful information from the users. And generally what this means is a diversity of different opinions, but also various perspectives about the software, whether it's easy to use, hard to use, etc. That means that the answer for this one is D. But I want to look at the other ones and show why these are not the answer. Let's start with A. A actually starts out on the right track. It says users can identify errors. It is true that the users can help to identify errors. In fact, that is one pretty useful reason to have users test out your software. However, a user's job is not to correct the error. The user can help you point out there's an error, but they should not be the ones that correct that error, which makes answer A false. Now, to my surprise, when I gave this quiz, most users put B. This is a little bit misleading. So here it says users can review the algorithms used in software and help improve their efficiency. I think the assumption here is that the users would see the program in action and help improve it. However, what this is talking about here is improving the efficiency of the software. That's up to the developers, not to the user. User has no stake in developing more efficient software. This is definitely not the role of a user. Now the final one is providing documentation. So the program code is not documented by the user. That should be fairly intuitive. The program code is never really modified or affected by the user at all. That means that answer C is also incorrect. Here's another similar question about the development process. This one's actually a little bit more obvious because as soon as we see answer A right here, we see right away that it cannot be right, even without reading the question. Answer A says, collaboration that includes diverse backgrounds and perspectives can eliminate the need for software testing. And this is always going to be incorrect because anything that suggests that you don't need to test your software is always going to be wrong. The point here that they're going to make is you always want to test your software. It doesn't matter what other things are happening, whether you have a diverse team, whether you have many engineers, software testing is always a requirement. So right away, without even reading the question, other than to find out what the question actually wants, in this case, which one of these is false, you can say that answer A is incorrect. So the question in general is asking what are the benefits of having a diverse team? And it does so by providing three benefits and one that is not. So we identify the one that is not. Let's look at the rest. It says that collaboration with a diversity of people and perspectives help anticipate the need of various users. That is definitely correct. That is definitely something that's true. Collaboration that includes diverse backgrounds can help avoid bias. So this is true. Being able to get the opinion of various diverse peoples can help you avoid bias. That is one of the great benefits of having a lot of different people in your team. Collaboration that includes diverse backgrounds and perspectives can reflect the strengths of individual team members. Also true, a lot of people have a variety of specializations, and by having a diverse group of people, you can rely on various people's specialties. A lot of the questions about the development process are actually going to be to identify inputs and outputs in your program. In this one, what they're asking about is which one of these is not likely to be an input for your program. Now, for this program, you would imagine that the user is providing some inputs, the program is doing some work, and then there's some outputs, display something on the screen, tells the user some information, et cetera. So in this program in particular, it says that the student is creating an application and it allows customers to order food for delivery from a local restaurant. So think about your general food delivery app on your phone. It's asking which one of these is not likely to be a input from the customer. So think of you using this app. Which of these do you feel is very unlikely to be an input that you as a user will be providing. The answer here is pretty clear that it should be the cost of the food item available for the order. If you're a user, you're not gonna be providing the cost of the food item. The cost of the food item is provided by the restaurants. You have no domain over that. What you can provide is all of the other information. You can provide the address for the delivery, that's your address, the credit card or payment information, that's also being provided by you, and maybe even the name of the food item to be included. So this is you selecting the food item. Those are all valid inputs. The cost of the food item is not an input that you would provide. Now here's a bigger problem that you might actually expect to see in an exam. So this is a common format for this type of problem about inputs and outputs. So the important thing to summarize this problem here 
is that we have an app here that helps us figure out where to eat with our friends. You can build a contact list of other users in the app. You specify a group of people who you want to eat with, all of the members of the group that you want to eat with, and then it's going to recommend something, which the recommendation is the output, and it's going to be based on whether the restaurant can accommodate all of the group members' allergies and dietary restrictions. So in essence, the members' allergies and dietary restrictions would be an important input here. This person, Alejandra, is using this app to try to organize a meal with her friends, Brandon and Cynthia. And now the question here is, which of the following are needed for Dine Out Helper to recommend a restaurant? So what this is essentially asking is, what are the inputs that Alejandra needs to provide for this app to work? More specifically, not even Alejandra herself, but what are the inputs that the app as a whole needs in order for this to work? In order for it to recommend something that circumvents people's allergies and dietary restrictions, we would need to know the food allergies and dietary restrictions of each member of the group. That's definitely a required thing. Also, in order to find a restaurant that is nearby, which is another important aspect, is that the fact that it needs to be nearby, we do need to know where Alejandra is. Otherwise, it would have no idea what is near this person. Now, the one thing we don't need from this list is this third item right here. We don't really care about the people in Brandon or Cynthia's contact list. Since Alejandra is the, the person who is making the request here, she only needs to know who is in her friend list. Who is in Brandon and Cynthia's don't really have any factor in this particular version of the problem, which means that the answer for this is 1 and 2 as well. Now this version of the prompt is actually the exact same setup. The entire first part of the question is exactly as it was before, but it has one little twist, which is right here at the end. Here at the end, it's asking which of the following data is not provided by Alejandra, but is necessary for Dine Out Helper to recommend a restaurant for the group. So the question essentially is, which of these pieces of data is necessary but is not provided by Alejandra? So let's see what we have here. The first item is Brandon's contact list. We saw from the previous question that although Brandon's contact list is not data provided by Alejandra, we also don't need it in order for a recommendation. Since Alejandra is the one trying to get the recommendation, we really don't care about who is in Brandon's contact list. So we can get rid of this. The second one is information about what restaurants Brandon and Cynthia has visited in the past. In the problem description, it doesn't mention anything about us caring which restaurants they have visited in the past in order to help make a decision. The decisions are only based on proximity to the user and allergies and dietary restrictions. It's pretty clear that those two are not part of the answer. So even if you weren't sure where to go next, you already know that the answer can only be B because it's the only one left over, but let's take a look at that one. Third one says, information about which food allergies and dietary restrictions can be accommodated at different restaurants near Alejandra. So we know that we want to find a restaurant that serves these dietary restrictions and food allergies, but Alejandra has no way of knowing what restaurants provide this service. It's on the restaurants to provide this information. However, it is necessary data for Dine Out Helper to make a recommendation, right? Because we know that in order to make a recommendation, they need to know about the allergies and restrictions. However, we can also confirm this is not data that is provided by Alejandra. Therefore, the answer for this one is B3 only. Thanks for watching. I'm Flavio, and I'll be back with more soon.